get to the rally point. Over and out. Can you back by five? Got it. Good morning. Buenos dias. So welcome, everyone. It is a real pleasure and honor uh, to introduce this closing alumni panel for our three-day event entitled Industries, Critical Role in the Apollo 11 Mission. My name is Teresa Mayer, and I'm the incoming Executive Vice President for Research and Partnerships. I've actually begun on August 1st. Um, I'm also a uh, Purdue alum, graduating with a degree in electrical and computer engineering in the 90s. So it is um, really exciting for me to be here today uh, to introduce this session and to be coming back uh, to Purdue after 25 years. <laughs> Thank you. So I hope many of you um, have spent uh, at least part of the last three days celebrating the long history of Purdue's extensive contributions to space exploration technology in research, education, and translation. And I think that's a really critical point that we touch so many lives um, and really uh, have led to enduring talent uh, that has um, led to transformative advances, and we look forward to a continued future. Um, as I return to Purdue, you know, I can uh, reflect and say that what sets Purdue apart, um, particularly in this field, are both the breadth as well as the depth across the disciplines and the very, very strong interactions in those disciplines, from uh, aerodynamics, to systems, to propulsions, to structures, um, and to materials. And all of those are critical, were critical to the technologies of the past, and as we look forward, they will be critical to the technologies of the future. And so I thought it would be fitting just to highlight a couple of examples of what the future looks like for us and what will lead us into the future. Um, and just a few months ago, in April of 2019, um, we announced uh, that Purdue had won a new $15 million program to establish a space technology research institute that is being funded by NASA. Um, this, together with uh, collaborators at five institutions, and well, as well as industry, um, is a funding work in resilient extraterrestrial habitat, um, and this is forming a new institute here at the university. And so this is a large thrust um, that will be looking at the design to operate deep, resilient space habitats. So you can see that we've come a long way in the last 50 years and this institute will be instrumental in thinking about the future. Um, if you were here earlier this week on Thursday, Dean Meng Chung announced a new cislunar space initiative, um, and this initiative is going to be instrumental in uniting and leveraging capabilities to increase access to the inner solar system by expanding space infrastructure beyond 
uh, the Earth's orbit to include the moon. So these are two very large initiatives among a very robust education and research program that includes many, many more examples. But these are two highlighting um, the future of Purdue education, research, and translation. Um, these, importantly, will continue Purdue's uh, legacy of research and collaboration, again, across science, engineering, and space exploration. So we look forward to the next 50 years and to stand here again um, sharing the extensive contributions that we will make on the future of space exploration. So with that, I would like to introduce the moderator of our panel, Stephen Collicott. Um, Stephen is a professor in the School of Aeronautics and Astro. Uh, uh, Astro. He has been with Purdue for the last 29 years, um, working in the area of zero gravity fluid dynamics. And I just had an opportunity to spend some time talking with Professor Collicott, who is deeply engaged in both research, um, but also in really advancing uh, our undergraduate uh, experiential or project learning-based education um, also reaching all the way down in the K through 12 arena so that we can uh, develop the very important talent pipeline for the future. Uh, he builds and flies experiments and weightlessness to advance space flights. Um, among many of the sponsors that he has, uh, both for the research and education are Blue Origin, where he's involved in uh, space launches. Again, uh, you know, very excitingly working with our K through 12 students and giving them opportunities to think about the future and encourage them to pursue degrees in science and engineering. So with that, I'd like to introduce Professor Collicott, who will moderate the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Hey, it's really great to be here tonight and see so many of you here uh, on this occasion um, to, you know, to participate in celebrating the Apollo 11 uh, lunar mission. It's, it's great. Um, I remember it well. I was an eight-year-old boy. I, was, I remember sitting in front of the black and white television uh, watching this amazing thing uh, unfold in front of me. Uh, so I really am a child of the moon race um, because in those years, my father, who was uh, Purdue mechanical engineering class of 51, actually worked on the ESEP uh, package, the scientific instruments that were left on the moon uh, on Apollo 13. So for me growing up, you know, I wanted to be a lunar astronaut. That was, that was the coolest job uh, around. Um, obviously I failed, but I'm, uh, Purdue aerospace professor is a pretty close second, okay? So um, it's great to see you, especially a number of K through 12 students out here at this public event. This is great. Um, we have a short video we're going to show you in addition to the one that's uh, a really fun one. I love that one that you just saw. And um, this is one many of you know, uh, so I'm not going to spoil it by talking about it ahead of time. Uh, it features uh, President John F. Kennedy at Rice University in September of 1962. And um, as I was one at the time, uh, I, I had to go recently and, and, and study some history so I could speak intelligently about this uh, remarkable uh, moment uh, in his presidency. And, um, you know, I learned that, uh, so that was September of 62. I learned that in May of 61, actually in an address to Joint Session of Congress on Urgent National Needs, that is where President Kennedy first laid out the notion in, in these very words of sending a, placing a man on the moon and bringing him home safely before the decade is out. So 470 days before this video we're going to see, uh, he had laid it out, but this is the one we, we always remember. Uh, perhaps the reason we always remember this one is because um, a now famous boilermaker, Brian Lamb, did not create C-SPAN until 18 years after that uh, uh, joint address to Congress. Um, also in that joint address, President Kennedy, I was reading, President Kennedy laid out a plan. Let me read a little bit here to you. He said uh, to Congress, he said, 
Uh, he urged funding to, quote, make the most of our present leadership by accelerating the use of space satellites for worldwide communications. He then explained, quote, when we have put into space a system that will enable people in remote areas of the Earth to exchange messages, hold conversations, and eventually see television programs, we will have achieved a success as beneficial as it will be striking. That's the end of the quote. So I, I've, doing my little history study, I'm amazed at how much the past decades venture capital pitches for funding for low Earth orbit satellite constellations sound so much like President Kennedy's 1961 uh, address. By now, of course, global communication satellites is a massive worldwide business conducting international commerce and bringing people closer together, as the saying goes. Uh, it's interesting, he also advocated for uh, funding for uh, satellites to help us better predict uh, extreme weather events. And of course, that's an every, that works so well now, it's an everyday thing. So what an exciting time it was at the start of the moon race. W the video we're going to watch here in just a minute is President Kennedy after we have had four American space flights. Two of them, the first two, right, Shepard and then Purdue's Gus Grissom were suborbital. The third, John Glenn, orbited the Earth. And the fourth, Scott Carpenter, orbited the Earth. And then this video happened. So these are pretty audacious words, especially if you think back to that congressional address I told you about. That was after one American space flight. So um, let, us, uh, let us enjoy this video from the early days of the space race. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won, and they must be won and used for the progress of all people. For space science, like nuclear science and all technology, has no conscience of its own. Whether it will become a force for good or ill depends on man, and only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence, can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace or a new terrifying theater of war. I do not say that we should or will go unprotected against the hostile misuse of space any more than we go unprotected against the hostile use of land or sea but I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind and its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. It is for these reasons that I regard the decision last year to shift our efforts in space from low to high gear as among the most important decisions that will be made during my incumbency in the office of the presidency. The growth of our science and education will be enriched by new knowledge of our universe and environment. 
by new techniques of learning and mapping and observation, by new tools and computers for industry, medicine, and the home, as well as the school, technical institutions such as Rice will reap the harvest of these gains. And finally, the space effort itself, while still in its infancy, has already created a great number of new companies and tens of thousands of new jobs. Space and related industries are generating new demands in investment and skilled personnel. And this city and this state and this region will share greatly in this growth. What was once the furthest outpost on the old frontier of the West will be the furthest outpost on the new frontier of science and space. Houston. Your city of Houston, with its manned spacecraft center, will become the heart of a large scientific and engineering community. During the next five years, the National Aeronautic and Space Administration expects to double the number of scientists and engineers in this area to increase its outlays for salaries and expenses to $60 million a year, to invest some $200 million in plant and laboratory facilities, and to direct or contract for new space efforts over $1 billion from this center in this city. To be sure, all this costs us all a good deal of money. This year's space budget is three times what it was in January 1961, and it is greater than the space budget of the previous eight years combined. That budget now stands at $5,400,000,000 a year, a staggering sum, though somewhat less than we pay for cigarettes and cigars every year. Space expenditures, <laughs> space expenditures will soon rise some more from 40 cents per person per week to more than 50 cents a week for every man, woman, and child in the United States. For we have given this program a high national priority, even though I realize that this is, in some measure, an act of faith and vision. For we do not now know what benefits await us. So we chose to go to the moon. We chose to do it. And uh, obviously we did it, and we're celebrating that today. But um, those are great words, and uh, again, what an exciting time. And yes, we remember this speech. Um, maybe it was the uh, young TV news industry where people watched, watched it excitedly at home that evening. Maybe it was uh, confluence or con you know, very, uh, multiple events uh, happening during the Cold War, and this was one of them, and that's why it's, it sticks in people's minds. But what a great time. So we went to the moon, and NASA did it. And NASA did it on rocket built by industry. Okay? And so we're going to uh, celebrate that industrial part of it tonight. That's what we're here for. And how does industry achieve a great thing like building a Saturn V rocket and a lunar module and a command module and service module and making it all happen? I, I, I would suggest they do it the same way NASA achieves great things, and that is by hiring people, all right? People like you and, and me and, and our wonderful alums who are gonna come out and tell you about how they, as people like you and me, um, helped put uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin uh, on the moon and Michael Collins uh, out there with them. So um, we're so fortunate that we can listen to the experiences and, and uh, knowledge which our three alumni uh, worked hard to acquire. Uh, they're here with us, they've traveled uh, to, to share with us and uh, perhaps uh, we can see how their contributions to delivering on President Kennedy's charge um, might inspire us or drive our, uh, our futures here. So first I'm going to introduce our, our guests no, I mean um, our Purdue family members who are coming out. And um, after that, they will uh, give a brief uh, discussion, a description of uh, their path, their, their interaction. And then I will have some questions to them to start the conversation going. 
And then uh, I think the important part then is the uh, public question period. You see we have two microphones down here, so when it's appropriate, I'll invite uh, people down and for questions for the panel. Uh, I'm, I'm merely here directing, okay? So, um, and then I do apologize in advance. Um, you know, I have orders to stop this at a certain time. These people who like give me a paycheck, so when they say stop, I'm, I'm stopping, all right? So, traveling to join us tonight and, and to share their wisdom with us are Tim Harmon, and uh, if they could come out, please. Tim Harmon and um, Chet Janes. Next, and there, here's Tim. And uh, these are in no certain order. Chet James with us here. And then, yes. And Ronald Larson. Well, okay, we have, we have uh, Tim on the end, then Ronald, then Chet closest to me. Did I get? Yeah, I'm so sorry, you are correct. Ron closest to me, Chet in the middle. They, they followed my, my cue, I'm, I'm my mistake. So gentlemen, thank you, uh, welcome, have a seat, grab your microphones, and um, uh, Ronald here, if you wanna start off uh, some minutes of uh, telling our, our audience um, about yourself and okay. your Apollo 11 involvement, thank you. Okay. So at some point, in oh there we go, let's back up here. Uh, so my name's Ron Larson. Uh, I uh, graduated from Purdue in the, uh, what then was the Department of Aeronautics, Astronautics, and Engineering Sciences uh, with the Engineering Sciences uh, preference. And at the time, uh, as an undergraduate, about the time you're, you're joining your, your sophomore year or so, you're supposed to make a decision. Uh, do you want to be a civil engineer? Do you want to be an electrical engineer? Do you want to be a mechanical engineer or, or what? Uh, and it came, came to be that time for a conversation, and I met with my uh, advisor, and I said, so what's your decision? And I said, I don't have one. Uh, and he said, I don't know what direction I want to go. And he says, that's fine. He says, we have a program for you too. Uh, and that's called Engineering Sciences. And it's a small program, uh, but we do, what we do is essentially create graduate students. And you can figure out later uh, <laughs> what you want to do. Well, I graduated in 1968. That was a time when, of course, the Vietnam War was in, in full uh, blossom and the draft was active. Uh, and at the time, uh, I was also very interested in NASA and aerospace, and the whole aerospace industry. Uh, and NASA at Goddard Space Flight Center offered me a position as a mathematician aerospace, aerospace technologist with a draft deferment. Uh, and so that was kind of a critical component at the time. Uh, that was a kind of the first major swing, I might say, in, in my, my career. But Goddard is not generally recognized as one of the major centers supporting the Apollo mission. So I wanted to kind of acquaint you a little bit with what we did there. Uh, so there were two major functions that we performed at Goddard for not only the Apollo missions, but this actually went back to Mercury and to Gemini, most of the scientific missions, uh, as well as uh, uh, Skylab and the ones that followed. So we did two things. One was manage the worldwide NASA communications network called NASCOM. The other thing we did was manage the operations of the worldwide tracking and data system. And this included a number of large S-band radars around the world, C-band radars, some mini-track interferometry systems around the world. And our job was to compute in real time the orbit of the spacecraft, to send that information, what we called acquisition data, downstream to the next tracking station in line so they would know where to point uh, their antennas. So we did this with two IBM System 360 Model 75 computers. That's what it looks like down in the lower left. Uh, these were massive machines. They had a megabyte of main memory. <clears throat> they performed at nearly a million floating point operations per second. That's a very small fraction of what each of us has in our pockets today. But at that time, it felt like a lot. It felt like a lot of computing power. In retrospect, it's amazing what we were able to actually do with that computing power. Here's a snapshot of where those tracking stations were that we coordinated with, operated, and managed through all of the, all of the missions, computing the acquisitions data, receiving data from uh, them, and then forwarding that downstream. So, 
the, the famous pictures you see of Neil Armstrong stepping down uh, from the uh, lunar module onto the uh, lunar surface were sent from the moon to our station at Carnarvon, Australia, up to Goddard, and then down to uh, the Johnson Space Center for forwarding uh, uh, thereafter. So what you see here is a snapshot of the uh, Carnarvon uh, S-band radar, uh, the control station uh, for that, and of course the world famous uh, image of uh, Neil stepping onto the, to the uh, lunar platform. So with that, let me uh, uh, pass the microphone on to uh, the next individual here. Okay, um, I'm a 1963 graduate of Purdue, and uh, I want to talk a bit maybe to the students and the students-to-be, because Purdue really set me up to work in the industry. I worked 42 years. I can call myself a rocket scientist because that's what I did for 42 years. First job I had, um, it was one where I actually, uh, first time I tested a rocket by myself, I blew it up. I, was, I had some problems. But what I want to say to the young people and the students is that Purdue does prepare you beyond school. And they prepared me very well to enter into aerospace. And I think that's an important thing because when you go to school, you get feedback on how you're doing because you take a test and you know how you're doing. You go to industry, you don't get grades, you get results. And the aerospace business really needed results. If we have a, oh, wait a minute, what did I do with the clicker? Put it in, I put it in my pocket, excuse me. I won't bore you with a lot of things, but I want to make a point or two. One is uh, the environment when I graduated. We had Sputnik and all these things. And the, you talk about, well, this is a, a space race. And you notice that when they launched Sputnik, that was a 178-pound satellite. Now, why did the Russians build such a big satellite? That was their estimate of what a nuclear bomb weighed. So that rocket was not made for the space race. That was made for the Cold War. They got a lot of publicity, but we recognize we're in trouble. Our engineering was behind. The Russians had some good stuff. It was a competition. And so this is our response. This was a commercial application. It was called the Vanguard. Our response to Sputnik went up four feet and blew up. Very impressive. Okay, this is the environment that I'm getting into. Uh, they came up with the Apollo. Big. Everything is big. It was a dramatic challenge to the industry. Here was, here's the problem. The fairy godmother's not coming. It's the engineers who are going to have to figure it out. If it's going to happen, it was to us. So I was involved in just a, a fair amount of uh, part of the Apollo program in the, in the 60s. And it's a, it's a great challenge to be uh, technically challenged, but it really helps if you have a top-notch education to back that up. So uh, I'd like to look at the next slide as kind of a, um, a family picture. This is the Apollo program, and uh, I, I uh, personally worked on 14 engines on this uh, vehicle. So I have a lot of experience with different size engines, with the people I worked with. Now, I'm not a major player, but it was a, it's just a mosaic of engineering talent that came a lot from Purdue. A lot of Purdue graduates where I worked. So uh, the, most, um, the engine that I really enjoyed working most was the last engine that was on the moon. It was the moon, it was the ascent engine that took the astronauts off the moon. The whole Apollo vehicle had redundancy. If you remember Apollo 13, 
they used about everything they could to bring those astronauts back. When Neil got on the moon, there was only one system that did not have redundancy. That was the ASN engine. And I uh, had the privilege to help make that engine work. There was no second chance on that engine. So uh, it's an interesting story. If you have questions on technical challenges and the pressure you have when you're responsible for the only engine that has to work, uh, I'll be happy to have questions and answer them. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Now, Chet. Good afternoon. My name is Chet Janes. I'm a 1957 graduate of Purdue in aeronautical engineering. Uh, I've spent my aerospace career from 1961 to 1969. Uh, I started uh, all of our years were at Cape Kennedy. Uh, I started with General Dynamics on the Atlas program and on the Atlas Centaur program. Now the Atlas was a, a kind of unique missile, okay, and then it was basically a stainless steel balloon, okay, which you loaded up with oxygen and fuel to keep it stiff, and then that was the one that was used to put a mercury capsule into orbit, okay. The previous flight on Redstone was suborbital flight. This is the first orbital flight with the Atlas. After that program, I went on to the Atlas Centaur program. The Centaur was a second stage missile that was hydrogen fueled and designed to put a surveyor capsule on the moon. The surveyor's purpose was to determine whether the astronauts were going to sink up to their knees or be able to stand on the surface or what, okay, because they were really unsure about what the surface of the moon was. Uh, I joined IBM in 1965 on the Apollo program. Uh, most of my career there was started with a Saturn 1B program and then evolved into the Saturn 5 program. And on Saturn 5, I was a mechanical systems manager for IBM on the flight of Apollo 11. Uh, I was in the firing room when Neil Armstrong lifted off the pad. Uh, I have some my pictures of some of the stuff was shown in the Armstrong Center, and in one of them, when you see them putting the instrument unit down, I'm in that picture, and I'm also in the one in the firing room, okay? Only I know where I am in the firing room. Nobody else would ever know where it is, okay? And after the Neil Armstrong got launched, my aerospace career basically ended, okay? Because what happened was we had parallel missiles in tandem, okay, because we had, we were on such a tight launch schedule, we had to launch every three months, which meant I was a manager on one launch vehicle and another guy was a manager on another launch vehicle. I was the manager on Apollo 11. We got the man on the, out of, on the way to the moon and they cut the program in half. Uh, so. One of us managers in our departments were basically surplus. The other manager had 14 years with IBM, and I had four, and give you three guesses who transferred. <laughs> and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about my participation in, in the program. It, it was uh, an honor and a great privilege to be there. I'm not sure I realized how great an honor it was when I was there because we were working lots of long hours, but I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, all three of you. Um, it's, it's interesting what you say about, um, you know, your recognition of what you were involved in, and I, I wanted to um, start with that with a discussion with, you know, like I said um, earlier, industry and NASA both accomplished uh, these great things by using people. And so if we start uh, closest here with Ron, um, when did you realize you were involved in um, one of the most amazing and greatest uh, engineering achievements in history? Well, I would say that was quite by accident, actually. I really didn't know what I was getting into at the time. Uh, and I was fortunate enough, and it was a true just an act of fate, uh, that I was hired by a small uh, group at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center called the Operations Support Computing Division 
uh, whose responsibility, as I described before, was to build these uh, software systems that ran on the best computers available at the time to do this job. Uh, so I came out thinking I was a mathematician, aerospace technologist is what I was hired at, not knowing quite what that meant. Uh, and uh, thrown into this environment, which was truly a team-oriented environment, I, had, I, was, I was in a group of about 10 people uh, who would routinely run 24 by 7 operations for any number of military, scientific, manned uh, missions. Uh, and I was certainly the, the youngest kid on the block uh, there, uh, but I felt like I was actually one of the team. It was a pretty amazing organization because we had people who were you know, true pioneers in the field, uh, but in our day-to-day -day working relationships, you would never know that. They just kind of brought everybody along. <clears throat> so as a very young 22-year-old uh, at, at the time, suddenly I found myself uh, in the Apollo mission uh, support arena, and I have to admit, it was a pretty exciting time. Very good. Uh, Chet, when did you realize the, the magnitude of what you were involved in? That's a kind of difficult question for me because we were involved in the Apollo program. I, I've been on numerous launches, okay? And so in, in some respects, it was a repetitive launch, okay? Now, we had a little, little bit different mission every time, okay? And this time we knew we were sending a man to the moon, okay? But I don't know that the, the magnitude of it really hit me till maybe after he got back from, back from space, okay? Wonderful. Tim? Okay, uh, when I hired in 63, the industry was really hiring. There were a lot of jobs out. So I'm hired in and I'm mentored by a experienced engineer who had hired in six months earlier than I had. <laughs> right after that, uh, we went up to the hill and he taught me how to test fire a rocket engine. Very interesting situation. Two weeks later, I'm testing rocket engines by myself. They put me on second shift. Now, there's a nice reason for that. Second shift is, you know, it's in the evening, and the managers are not around. So I can make mistakes and uh, get away with it, I guess is the way to say it. But you knew it was an environment that was busy. Uh, Rocketdyne was hiring. We probably were hiring three, 4,000 new engineers a year. So the program was expanding. There was just tremendous work. Uh, and the environment was, uh, everybody bought into it. We knew we were going to the moon. We knew we were behind the Russians. We knew we had a tight schedule. Rockets just don't get built in a minute. And so all those things, everybody pitched in. Uh, I had one instance where um, it was a 24-7 operation. We had to get tests off in a very rapid order. Uh, in, in those days, I wore contact lenses. Now, uh, for people, at, uh, the early contact lenses, you, want, you run out of wearing time. And so I'm going to work for 24 hours straight. The problem is I can't use contact lenses the whole time. Uh, and I can't see without them. And here we'll run a test and I can't see the parameters. So I figured the way to get around that was to wear one at a time. So I'd wear one contact lens and go around kind of reading instruments, see how the operation went. And then when I really got tired, I'd take that lens out, put the other one in, and that way I could complete the test. So those were just kind of things you were expected to do. You had to get the job done as fast as you can, but do it, do it well. And that was just one incident that uh, showed that. You know, that must have been tough uh, to be on such a fast-paced critical schedule with such exacting requirements as, you know, flight safety and mission assurance for putting a man on the moon. Were there temptations to shortcut? What how did people work that? This is a really good one. Uh, the last program I worked on was the Lama Sen engine, and I like to talk about that because I'm very proud of that. Um, the Lama Sen engine was really scheduled tight, and so you, you're, you're tempted to uh, cut corners. You can't do that. A man's life is really there. You know, the engine uh, in the vehicle is inside, and that would be Neil Armstrong. Here was the engine. Here's Buzz Aldrin. So it's, we're all together in this thing. And this engine doesn't have a backup. It's got to work. 
So we're testing this engine, but to not cut corners, you have to change the way you operate. And what we did is we, we had engineering, we had um, manufacturing, we had quality control, we had inspection, we had the Air Force, we had NASA, and they were all in one building, one room, essentially, working together. So if we wanted to run a test, and uh, we said, well, we're going to do this, we'd get the input right there from manufacturing or from the test organization. Well, you can do this uh, if you want 20 instruments. I don't have 20 instruments. I got 10. Can you work with that? So we'd all make these adjustments. And we'd do this in a 15-minute meeting every morning in a stand-up meeting, like you see a Volkswagen stuffed full of people, and it would, we'd have all these people together at once, decide what we're going to do that day, go do it, and we did it around the clock. So that was a way not, uh, that was a way to get something done fast, but not cut corners. Thank you. Um, Chet, you also spoke of uh, the workload. Um, you know, this um, takes us back to the recent movie, uh, Hidden Figures, when um, after Yuri Gagarin orbited, and uh, the character portrayed by Kevin Costner, who I understand is a combination of, of real characters, uh, you know, had to give this pep talk about, um, we've got to catch up, we've got to beat them, and um, you're not going to be home for dinner. Uh, overtime is the new normal. Um, was that style of, that was the Mercury program. Was that style of work, did that style of work persist into Apollo program years? Uh, not only in the Apollo program, on the previous programs I was on also, okay, we were always, uh, especially the Centaur program, we were on a schedule to try to get the surveyor on the moon so the information could come back to the designers of Apollo in case they needed to make any adjustments, okay? I can specifically remember uh, a, a case where I worked uh, back-to-back 80-hour -back work weeks, and I did not work on Sunday in either one of those weeks, okay? Uh, when I interviewed with IBM, uh, the interview was basically over, and I was walking out, and the man that interviewed me says, oh, I wanted to ask you about, would you work overtime? <laughs> and I, I stopped and said, well, I really had it up to here with overtime, but I'll do my share, okay? So, uh, my, my third week with, uh, with IBM, I went on second shift, <laughs> and I had a technician that work, worked, had been there and knew his way around, and a, a technician experienced and hired in the same day I did. Now, when I got hired by IBM, my experience was exactly what they kind of needed, structural and airborne, airborne uh, air, uh, environment. And so the third week, I was on second shift, uh, as engineer in charge, and I came into work early that day because I had to have a physical, because I worked in a hazardous environment. Well, we ran into a little problem that night. Uh, we didn't, but the people who were testing the flight control computer had a problem. And, that, and the problem necessitated removing the flight control computer from the instrument unit, which means we had to take some fixtures inside, unplug that unit, unbolt it, put it on a fixture, take it back around, take it out of the IU, take it up to the engineering lab where they had unsoldered the can, and, and the flight control computer was what we affectionately call the garbage can. Not because it was garbage, but because it sort of looked like a garbage can. It was about, about this big around, okay, and so big. And it was a simple little problem, and I don't know, in those early days, I guess a lot of things got done in a little bit of a hurry. It was a diode that was in backwards, okay? But they had to, to open up the can, change the diode, test it, and put it back together, and we took it out to the launch pad. And so I went to work at 2 o'clock on that afternoon, and I got home at 8.30 the next morning. Uh, that was a little bit unusual, but overtime was uh, just a way of life, okay? You had to, fortunately, uh, a lot of it didn't involve extra long hours, but it may involve an extra day, or uh, we also had to, had to rotate shifts uh, as a, 
as a manager, I had to do some turns on second shift and at least once a year a turn on third shift, okay? So uh, it was some, some disruption to the family, but not real bad except when we got close to lunchtime, when the schedule went kind of haywire, because we had to be on, on site 24-7, uh, myself and the electrical engineering manager and our, our boss, one of us had to be on site every hour of every day. So it, it could get pretty intense. Ron, any thoughts on that? Well, listening to uh, Chet's story did remind me of uh, probably the, the, the most difficult and maybe the most embarrassing uh, moment for me personally in one of these missions. We, uh, uh, I had developed a, uh, a database system which was supposed to be a part of the real-time support system where an analyst could come up and make an arbitrary request for any tracking data from any station in any combination in any time window that, that might be. So, uh, and I wrote this program. Uh, and at the time, we had three levels of systems that we would use before we got into a mission support environment. There was the uh, development system, which was expected to break. That's why you had it. Uh, there was then a test system where things that had passed the development system uh, and looked like they were robust and sufficient to operate, would go to the next level. We would use that system in simulations, for example, of live missions. Uh, and then there was the live mission support system, and the only thing that ever went into that system uh, were truly the things that you knew were, were robust to the point that they would never fail. Well, so the system that I had written made it through the development system to the test system, was now in the mission operation system, and we were in one of the Apollo missions. I don't remember which one. And a data analyst comes up, and I was sitting at the console, and he gives me the parameters for a particular combination of data that he wanted to download and analyze. I dutifully type that in, and the machine crashes. It's dead in the water. <clears throat> And we have, fortunately, we have two, so the other one is taking control. But in the meantime, we've got to figure out in real time what went on here. So we get a, at the time, we would debug these things by getting a total memory dump, stack of paper about this thick, take that back into the office. And there was, I have to admit, a little bit of pressure to figure out what the heck went wrong uh, that forced the machine to, to crash in this environment. But in you know, a relatively short period of time, we'd be able to determine that, remember, this was a real-time system. Real-time systems have to interact with the real world. And in, we thought we had covered essentially all of the possible bases, but we were wrong. And when we looked at the actual scenario of how the data came in on that particular mission, we had never tested that one. And that was, of course, the one that brought the whole system down. Uh, so you don't, want to, you don't want that to happen in a live mission, but every once in a while it does and you remember it. <laughs> I bet you do, clearly. Um, you know, one of the uh, fun parts of you know, this 50th uh, anniversary is tying 50 years ago and, and, and today uh, together somehow in our minds. And, and this movie, Hidden Figures, is, is a great way to do that. And I wanted to uh, take a more uh, pointed question. Um, you know, that film uh, clearly illustrates uh, some significant racial inequalities. Uh, as they played out in NASA's workforce there in the early 1960s in the Mercury program. Were these uh, social issues, uh, inequalities still evident within NASA and industry in general years later in the Apollo program? Uh, I'll pick that up as a, as a start, because after when I, when I watched Hidden Figures, that was actually one of the things which struck me as surprising. And I mean, surprising in the sense that I recognized what was going on in the era and, and what that felt like. But the surprising part to me was when I got to Goddard, uh, this group that uh, invited me to join their team uh, was not like that at all. Uh, now, recognizing that this is not a general statement of all of NASA or all of industry, but within this one group, we had uh, three African Americans uh, one of whom was the section head, another of whom was the assistant section head. Uh, we had uh, uh, two females. We had a Latino. Uh, there was, a, I thought, in retrospect, looking back at that, the diversity within that group was, I think, 
pretty striking for the time. And I'm not quite sure what, if that was an accident of fate, uh, whether it was because Goddard is located right outside of Washington, D.C. in Greenbelt, Maryland, and so there was some advantage there. But whatever it was, I thought uh, Goddard might have been ahead of the game in terms of actually dealing effectively with inclusion and diversity uh, issues. And in, in retrospect, it certainly felt that way at the time, because we really didn't notice it that much at the time until we saw it. Like, you see the movie Hidden Figures, and you say, wow, that is a dramatic change from Mercury days to Apollo days in a relatively short number of years, if that was the transition that was happening. I'd like to comment on that, too. Um, we, when I saw that movie, uh, we, when you're testing a rocket engine, you just generate tons of data. And we had a hidden figures department that uh, literally did that, and it would be maybe 50 people. Uh, I will say, though, that for um, opportunities, if you, if you were reasonable in math, you could do it. And a lot of the people in there were women. Um, they were maybe math teachers or something, and a lot of them uh, were working second shift because uh, we generate the data during the day and it had to be turned around overnight. However, when I was in school, uh, let's say 1960, there was only one female aeronautical engineer in my class, only one. So the women had not really awakened to the, that opportunity and maybe there was some resistance to it. She was very competent and uh, I think uh, in the industry, if you were competent, uh, it wasn't really necessary that you had a degree. Uh, we had a lot of design people that were not college uh, degrees, but they worked on airplanes and that sort of thing. So it was almost if you had an ability, uh, we needed you and we would use you. Well, in launch operations, it was a totally male operation, okay? <laughs> they were, my, the only, uh, I, had a, I had a secretary uh, who was female. Uh, However, when I was in school, going back that I, uh, I had a, uh, one young lady who was in class with me throughout my entire class in aeronautical engineering. And there was also a, a young lady who I met uh, just a few years ago who had a degree in uh, transport, air transportation who was in school at the same time I was. We discovered that we graduated from Purdue in the same year, in the same school, but we didn't ever know one another. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. So I think uh, this is a great time now to uh, open up to the, the public uh, question session. And um, I wanna start it uh, in, in one special way. I, I'm going to require the first question to be one of our K through 12 uh, visitors here. Uh, I see one here, one here, uh, a couple others. Somebody wanna start us off? Oh, come on. When else are you going to get a chance to ask a question of so much experience? <laughs> All right. Well, then uh, the general public. Yes, please. Uh, we have microphones at the front. Uh, I'll, I'll point at who's next and come on down. And if you're in the balcony and wish to come down, go ahead. Hello. Um, my question is for both of you gentlemen here. Um, have a lot more, but um, when Neil Armstrong had crashed with the LEM on, on mm -hmm. and also in Gemini 9, um, 8, mm -hmm. um, when, what, what exactly was wrong in those situations and how did you fix it? <laughs> um, I knew the situation, uh, a valve had stuck open on the Gemini. Uh, the, the solution, uh, I, I was not involved in that particular program. Uh, all I know is it did stick, uh, and uh, Neil was uh, brilliant in activating a system that would uh, resolve the issue. Uh, so it, it shows, I guess it really shows you, you need engineering sense. You gotta know what's going on. Uh, you've got physics, all right? You can't break laws of physics, but there is an art 
to it. And by that, I mean is you've got to recognize something isn't right, and then well, how do I fix it? And that, that was probably why we uh, tested. We tested and tested and tested. And even that, uh, so that those engines, when we sent an astronaut up, uh, we were comfortable at work. And yet, still there was something uh, went awry. It was probably a, a stray electrical signal, something like that, that stuck a valve open. And then engineering in Neil Armstrong had to figure out what it was. And there were enough redundancies in that vehicle that he could overcome that issue. And I think that's, that speaks well for engineering, but it also speaks well for having some knowledge and thinking uh, there is a solution to this problem. What was the, that was Gemini, what was the other one? Uh, on the limb when he was on the, on Earth, and he was testing it. The simulator? And he had, and he had yeah. Had that, um, my understanding was that that was a failure within that simulator. Uh, didn't really have to do with anything. Uh, that simulator was pretty unstable, and um, because, uh, if you know more about this than I do, but I believe they either ran out of uh, pressurization or something, and again, Neil realized that this thing isn't working anymore, and it's time to leave the ship. So, and they, shortly after that, uh, they stopped using that device because it was just too unstable. And, and that would, did that fly mostly like a helicopter? Because... Yeah, the question is, is that mostly like a helicopter? Yeah, but it was not like a helicopter. It was attempts <laughs> to ma make uh, if the effect of zero gravity and that sort of stuff. And he, Very good. Did he take helicopter lessons then? Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hello. Um, I would like to ask what your perspective is on all of the new advancements being made in the aerospace industry and all of the other science industries, science-related industries, um, throughout the past 50 years and especially now with our perspectives going all the way to, the, to Mars, maybe throughout the solar system, so how your view is on all of that. Uh, okay, uh, th this is, uh, I think, uh, Steve had a thought of, you know, where the industry's going, is that what you're kind of asking, is uh, where we... Right. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, I want to, um, please, I'm going to take this one, but please feel free to speak up. Because uh, I asked, um, my daughter-in-law works for JPL, so I asked her that question. I'm 15 years out of the business. The Apollo program was an analog program, essentially, okay? Dials, pressure gauges, stuff like that. By the time we get to the shuttle, we're starting to go digital. And now we're kind of in a digital era. And, but where is things going? Okay, we got the Apollo program. Uh, NASA is looking at Artemis, the twin of Apollo. There is lots of exploration in satellites, and it's going to be remote, and it's going to be digital, and I think there's going to be jobs there. A, it's got to be, you've got to be digital, and you've got to know the physics, and then, um, and, and always know the math. Uh, another thing about engineering, if you know the math, you can bluff your way through almost anything. Except my exams, okay. <laughs> Well, I think the, the, the only thing I would maybe add to that is, uh, I think the, the, from my perspective, one of the more exciting things that we've seen over the past few years is the emergence of these commercial firms that are taking on the entire challenge. I mean, where would we be without people like Elon Musk coming out and say, I can do that, you know, and then surprising the world by actually doing it. You know, it's pretty amazing. So I think that's, that's a, a pretty major shift to see uh, commercial entrepreneurs actually thinking, that's something that I can do and then proving that, in fact, they can. How do you feel about that? I think it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, it, I would put my money on that before I would put my money on the, this federal government supporting the space program in any dramatic kind of way. <laughs> Good question. Thank you. This gentleman here. Well, keeping you on a roll, <laughs> many of us here in Indiana of a certain age remember where we were 50 years ago tonight when we saw those first television images, and you showed us the antenna. And I had read somewhere that NASA had not come up with a decent 
interface between what they were getting to the TV network's feed, and they, they actually set a camera in front of one of the NASA screens to convert that to that. Is, do you know anything about that? That's a really interesting story. I have never heard that, although I have heard, I mean, it, 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 it seems plausible because the uh, network at that point was running at a, at a remarkably low bandwidth by contemporary standards. We're talking like 40 kilobits per second was considered, I think was, was about what they were using for the, uh, the, the TV broadcast type of thing. It was an extraordinarily low bandwidth. <clears throat> and, and they did that by a lot of uh, kind of background trickery. Of, in fact, if you remember uh, the images uh, coming back from Apollo 8, <clears throat> uh, you could see uh, they, they were not actually solid images. There were, there was, there were shadows behind it. So as you see uh, Neil going, uh, bouncing across in front of the lamb, you could still see kind of the lamb through him like he was pseudo-transparent. So there were, there were games being played from a video standpoint to try to make that as real looking as possible. That particular one that you're mentioning, though, is fascinating. I've never heard that. It could very well be likely just as a kind of cheap, quick, easy way of doing a bandwidth uh, 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 switch. Well, if it's true, it seems like NASA was de so dependent on public support that that would be a major PR gaffe to n not be able to fair do enough. something like that. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Thank you. My question is, if there was a book written about the work you did, what detail would be overlooked that you think is important to you? If there was a book written about the work that you have completed, what detail would probably be overlooked in the book, but you don't think it would be, do you think it is important to you? You're looking at me. <laughs> I'll start out. Uh, in 1980, um, I was fortunate enough to participate in a, a, an astounding study, <clears throat> looking, looking back at it this time. It was fairly simple, in a sense. It was a group, uh, <clears throat> they, they, they uh, invited 20 individuals from industry and 20 individuals from NASA uh, to come to the University of Santa Clara and spend the summer there uh, fantasizing the following question. If budget were not a limit, what could this country do over the next 50 years in, sp in space? <clears throat> and limited only by the imagination and by physics, by, by engineering know-how, I and mean, it has to be real, right? So the group that, that uh, we had on that uh, panel, like I was, I was I was fortunate enough to be one of the participants, but one of the other participants was a gentleman uh, named George von Tiesenhausen, who uh, Werner von Braun brought over from uh, Pienemunde, uh, from G Germany, with, with, with that group. Uh, he was a, 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 a truly remarkable uh, engineer. Uh, <clears throat> we were also joined by, a, I believe he was a mathematician, below my memory may be dim on that, John Tukey from Princeton. Uh, and one of, the, one of the tasks that people began to explore that summer was, if we were serious about doing interstellar exploration, how would we do it? Now this was shortly after Voyager had been launched. And so the idea was, those of you that remember Voyager, that had, we would go out, uh, uh, it was gonna hit several planets and then go out beyond the uh, solar system. And they had this little gold plaque on it. There's a recording of all kinds of things on it. They said, that's not the way you do interstellar exploration. You don't send one probe out into the, uh, out into the void. And the way you do it is you have to master some form of, exp of uh, exponential growth. You have to be able to send one spacecraft out because getting mass off the face of the Earth is incredibly expensive. And then you've got to figure out ways for it to self-replicate along the way. You know, mine the asteroids, that kind of thing, and build replicas of itself using robotic forms. So, very controversial at the time. There are a lot of people saying this is silly. There's no way you could do that. That's where George von Tiesenhausen stepped in. And he started demonstrating that, in fact, the pieces of this you could actually put in place and you could see how to do this. Uh, so that became one of the center pieces of the exploration that Summers could do and really do that. And this is where John Tukey from Princeton comes, comes, comes in because he uh, said that the one thing we can't make in, in space, but we don't know how to make it, would be 
the, uh, the semiconductor controls, the things that, uh, the, the small devices that would be used to actually control these, these spacecraft. But the lucky thing is they don't cost very much. I mean, they don't weigh very much, so they're cheap to get up there. So we had another group that was concerned, well, if you master exponential growth, suppose this thing gets out of control, and suddenly you have this uncontrollable number of spacecraft flying around the universe. So, so that's where John Tukey, again, controlled it, because the control on this is how many of these semiconductor devices can you launch at the time, and that's the maximum size that this family of spacecraft would ever grow to. Uh, so I mentioned that only because, and there were several other things that we tried to do in that time, but the, 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 the thing that I think we missed was Apollo was a, a, a real emergent opportunity. It, was, it rallied the industry, it rallied the government, it rallied the, the population, it had this exciting moment around these very few moments of, of exploration through a very few number of years. Was it 72, was that Apollo 17? It, yeah, so we're looking at you know, three, four years. Imagine what we could have done if we had maintained that kind of momentum. So when I look back, I think the thing we missed was the opportunity to sustain that kind of momentum, to, to say this really is the future of mankind, but it's going to take sustained investment. We never were able to actually do that. Uh, Chet, any comments? Or? Uh, yeah, another opportunity or another a mindset. I think you, you do, uh, you, you've got to have somebody willing to think outside the box. And that's where Elon Musk has kind of rejuvenated the launch things. But you can get down into the mundane uh, if, you, if you just have a, a technical issue. And, and one time we had a technical issue where we couldn't detect whether uh, a weld, just a weld, was any good. And so how do you get around that? Well, we couldn't take an x-ray of it. So uh, <laughs> they gave me this assignment. Okay, find a way that we can decide if this weld will hold. And, and basically, uh, you had to think out of the box. And, then, and it wasn't like I'm going to invent something. I just used a microscope and kind of a ruler under a microscope. And I could uh, measure, physically measure, where that weld was on this injector. And it was, this is small stuff, but it wasn't rocket science. It was just looking at it and doing a, you know, a simple measurement, thinking outside the box. I didn't need to find an x-ray machine that could do this, but I could measure it because I could see it. And so if you, if you keep that in mind that you don't get stuck, look, oh, we've got to do something or we've got to buy a machine, maybe it's just a microscope and some measurements and you can solve that issue. So thinking outside the box, whether it's big or small. Thank you. Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Over here. Uh, if the space exploration advances hadn't occurred during the circumstances of the Cold War, do you think that the government would have still donated as much time and resources to the cause as it did? I'd like, I, I want to take that. Um, <laughs> Because uh, one thing that w was, um, we had the Russians, okay, and we had this competition with the Russians, and we were behind, and it was kind of an ego thing, but the, you know, after the war, the U.S. was building cars, building planes, they were building everything, and we looked good. The Russians found that uh, maybe one way they can upset it in, uh, is launch a satellite, and we didn't do anything with that, and so our ego was hurt, too. But the Russians do things in secret. And part of that secret is like I just said, they launched something that could toss a bomb big, and they didn't mention that. And we knew that. Uh, don't, don't think we were shy on that. But the Apollo program was a public program. It wasn't secret, and so we were advertising our abilities. And I think that inspired, inspired a generation of people. And that's an important thing to do. You've got to you got to get inspired. I mean, engineering, you just don't walk in and become an engineer uh, or any field. You've got to be kind of inspired. I want to be a nurse. That's cool. You're inspired to do that. And I think the Apollo program, because it was public, and uh, it did advance the digital age. We're where we are today a great deal because of the Apollo program, and it was a public program, and it inspired people. 
And I, I hope uh, we need things like that. We're, we're not building the better um, Abrams tank. We're building something that will inspire people. Uh, and Neil was such an example. We don't have heroes that are Boy Scouts. Okay, we got, we need models uh, that are people that will then convince other people to become engineers, scientists, nurses, doctors, whatever it is. It's just that type of thing. And that's the, that's the beauty of the Apollo program. It was a public program. It wasn't a military program. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Great. Okay. Next question. So, obviously, reaching the moon um, is an incredible achievement and all the things, all the milestones leading up to that. Um, can you comment on um, how you personally um, use like new tech, brand new technologies, maybe uh, brand new materials are coming out, um, and maybe how that aggressiveness, I guess is the word I'd use, compares to other projects you maybe worked on since, um, as a, like in terms of how willing you are to adopt brand new things on your projects. I, I guess we, from, from my perspective, one of the things that, that came out of the Apollo program was how to manage a really large project, okay? Uh, where you have multiple companies, and I, I have to give NASA credit, I think they did a really good job. There was a lot of learning curve to make that happen, okay? Uh, and internally at IBM, we had a lot of learning, learning curve to, to, to do the same thing. But all in all, I think the fact that uh, you saw in Apollo 11 the culmination of all of, all of that activity, okay, that launch countdown went off without a hitch, okay? Uh, we had a lot of built-in built delays in there to give people time to solve problems. And they basically did not, did not get to use. So I think that one of the big things that came out of the program was, was a roadmap, if you will, okay, on how to successfully manage multiple disciplines, very large projects. Might add one one thought to the, to that. Uh, the uh, particularly in the manned missions. Uh, as you've heard earlier, I mean, safety was always paramount uh, <clears throat> there. Uh, and that almost predestines the technology to a fairly conservative uh, avenue. And I think you saw that for the most part, at least in the, uh, in, let's say, in the, in the computing and the information sides, but probably less so in the materials part because they had the necessity to be more exploratory and more experimental in that era. Uh, but I was reminded as Chet was speaking uh, <clears throat> that uh, if you look at the use of computing devices in the space program, the first machine that used a rotating disk was actually on a laptop computer carried by an astronaut. It wasn't part of the actual infrastructure of it all. And the fear was, uh, that a rotating disk was such a precise mechanism that it wouldn't survive launch. Uh, and so it, everything was actually, from that perspective, d demonstrably uh, conservative in, in its approach. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, two questions. A quick one to Chet. I'm very curious as to what the medal is that you're wearing. <laughs> and then one for the, for the broad group. Um, a few years ago, I read the book uh, Angle of Attack, which is about North American aviation and their mindset change from just making airplanes to deciding to get into uh, the Apollo program, and they ended up doing the work for the command module and the second stage. And one thing that really came out to me as I read that book was kind of building on what you said about you got people who have degrees and you have people who didn't have degrees but they had talent and skills and knew how to do things. And I see this uh, in this book about these were men who, and people, I won't say men, but people who knew what to do, knew how to do things. And it was kind of like the, the 1950s and 1960s seemed to be a culture of being able to kind of get out of their way and let them do what they needed to do. My favorite anecdotal story in it was they were trying to plug 
their projector into a, a hotel ballroom uh, outlet to tell to show NASA what they wanted to do for a, their command module, and they had a polarized plug on their extension cord. And the guy just whipped out his pocket knife, whacked it off, stripped the wires, and shoved them right into the outlet. <laughs> Uh, I'm curious, in the work that you have have done for Ap Apollo, did you come to those kind of, do you have any of those kind of MacGyver kind of stories of how you had to kind of bend the rules and, and do what needed to be done to get, to get things moving? Well, well, what you're really talking about is problem solving, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, going back to talk about thinking outside the box, that's what you have to do sometimes, okay? You, uh, you need to, don't need to get hemmed in by maybe even what you were taught or what you have learned, but you have to take that experience and that education and apply it in a little different way, okay? I'll take the North American part. Um, we had a president, I, he, we, we, after World War II, uh, the gentleman's name was Dutch Kindleberger. And he, he helped uh, the P-51, uh, the Sabre Jets. So he was, uh, he was a mover and a shaker. And he had a very interesting style. Uh, and he, he was just well known. He, he was probably the Elon Musk of that particular age. And uh, by that, I mean he, he roamed the halls type thing of, of uh, say, the Air Force and uh, try and figure out their needs. Uh, and, and another aspect, uh, slightly humorous, uh, we, um, this is back in NASA, and NASA, the ascent engine, which I worked on, uh, originally, it was behind schedule. Now, we recognize that. I mean, the industry recognized it. All the rockets on the Apollo program, except that ascent engine, had passed qual. Now, we're not working in a vacuum, but we also had people that were skilled at reading documents upside down. In other words, somebody go in and shoot the breeze with the NASA manager, and he'd notice on his desk there that, hmm, the ascent engine's got a problem. <laughs> so uh, he passed the word back, and so we realized we had a heads up that maybe something was coming down the pipeline. And we react to it, and we reacted to it by saying, well, we're gonna, they maybe need, need an injector. We need aluminum. Dutch Kendallberg, not Dutch, it was our president, he, he called Boeing, have you got a chunk of aluminum that we could buy? And he bought it even before NASA said, we need help. And so he anticipated, uh, the management anticipated needs. And uh, that's, that's key to, to uh, advancing the thing. You, you understand your customer, you get and you react to what we think's coming down the pipeline. Very nice, I see Ron has a microphone. Well, I was gonna say, if, if, if you have a moment for levity uh, in, in, in that regard, uh, I, I took a trip down to Johnson Space Center at one point when ch checked into a strip motel uh, near, the, near the center uh, and went in to use the, uh, use the bathroom. And when I flushed the toilet, there was water spraying on the wall behind the uh, toilet. And so uh, I was thinking, well, I could call the manager. I could look into this myself. So I took the lid off the toilet <laughs> and discovered that there was a wedge uh, in the porcelain in the back. It, was, it was, was broken out, so you had this wedge, and the valve had this leak in it, so it was spraying water right through that, through that wedge. So I took the, the, one of the plastic glasses from the, the sink and put it over the valve, weighed it down with the top, solved the problem. So I tell this because I came back, and I told this story to a fellow in my carpool, and a year later, he goes down to Johnson Space Center, and he comes back and he says, Ron, your glass is still on that toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, over here now. Chet, I, I didn't get the answer on Chet's uh, medal. Well, I oh. just was going to bring up something you, you talked about. Uh, I had an experience uh, when I was at IBM outside of the space program, but IBM had a program that if, that if you have the skill and the knowledge, and, and this was a case of a guy who did not have a college degree, okay, and he was Mr. Printer in IBM, okay. Uh, he got, we had a special program, uh, if you became an IBM fellow, you got X amount of dollars and a staff to work on whatever project you wanted to work on, okay. 
which meant you really had to know what you were doing. And, and this guy was absolutely brilliant, okay? But, and he, he ran a whole organization of making printers, okay? You didn't answer your metal. Pardon? You didn't answer the metal. The, the metal Tell us about the metal. You're wearing around your... Right here. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is it? You, you, you gotta love your work. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, th we, we have thank you, and uh, it's great to be with three of the 400,000 plus who helped put Apollo on the moon. Thanks. So we, we have time, uh, these two gentlemen who are up here, and um, go okay. ahead. I was hoping I could get someone to talk about the uh, Lemison engine, Okay. possibly. <laughs> um, well, I think you undersold it a bit. Um, uh, the Lemison engine, uh, for those who don't know, um, Okay, like the second and third stage of, of Saturn burned hydrogen and oxygen. As you may know, we're all sitting in it right now, uh, and it doesn't spontaneously burn uh, unless there's, you know, heat involved. Uh, the oxidizer and the fuel for the Lemison engine uh, burn spontaneously when they come in contact with, uh, with each other, just a very few molecules. And not only that, it's also incredibly poisonous. So when there's a, you know, box sitting between uh, Buzz and Neil, uh, it's not only filled with explosive, it's filled with poisonous explosive. Um, and they got the finished product. Um, it was the guys that were building it while it was potentially not perfected and still leaking stuff all over the place uh, that are kind of the heroes, in my opinion. Um, did you have any uh, mishaps, things that happened uh, during the development? Uh, Boy, I, I can, you really started my button here. <laughs> uh, okay, um, the, the combustion process, I burned everything from hydrogen to buffalo chips, okay, so I'm, I'm a combustion expert. Uh, but if you look at a candle, a candle doesn't just burn straight up, it wiggles. Combustion is not a smooth process. Now, he's talking two propellants there that really don't like each other, and they blow up when they see each other. So this engine was going unstable. And if you can imagine, and I don't see, well, if you've ever been to a rock concert like that, the, that there, there are speakers that are that size at a rock concert that send out noise. Okay, and if you've ever been to a rock concert and one of those speakers overdrives, you get a big, bang, it just irritates your ears and it screeches. With combustion instability, you have a frequency when, this is technical, sorry, you have a frequency that gets in tune with the combustion process and it gets energy from it. And if you get that energy from it, you blow up. And so these propellants like to do that. One way around that is you never let a hydrazine or unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine, sorry. At any rate, you never let it get to the combustion chamber first. If it gets there, it can explode. If you, as soon as you pour oxygen on it, you have an explosion. So you've got to make sure the oxygen gets there first. Now, it's not rocket science. All you do is make sure the volume to fill the injector fills first with the oxidizer. So you get the oxidizer into that injector first. Then you add the fuel, boom, it goes. The next thing is, sometimes it just will go, it will get in sync with combustion process. So now you gotta stop that, and how do you do that? Well, you can put baffles in an injector. That changes frequencies. It's just like changing to a smaller speaker type thing. But, uh, and this was something we just kind of fell into at Rocketdyne, we notice that if you have a gap around the outside of an injector, sometimes that screws up these coupling between the combustion process and the vibration or frequencies. This is called an acoustic cavity. It's got other words. That was the ingredient we added to that injector that the original designer uh, could not overcome. And when we added that, we stabilized it. And I did the testing on this. And by that, we, put, we take a bomb and we stick it into the combustion chamber, turn the rocket engine on, fire off that bomb, blows out the fire, blows it out. 
the engine's got to restart within less than 30 milliseconds and run. So if it can handle that kind of upset, Neil Armstrong's safe. And this, this rocket engine's right here. There's Neil, there's Buzz. And when that thing started, I was completely confident. And I felt like, I, this isn't just one test. I didn't just do one test. I ran that engine 400 times. I threw off 400 bombs in that engine. And so I was and at different operating conditions, because you never know what the environment is exactly. So I'm very proud that I wrung that thing out. And for the stability issue, I was comfortable sitting next, I would have been comfortable sitting next to that engine. Uh, to say I was uh, nervous, I wasn't nervous. I, I knew this thing was working because I had done the tests and I was really comfortable with that. But I was completely gratified and really satisfied. Another thing, you know, you always say, well, where was I uh, when the Neil landed on the moon? This is a side. We didn't have television in our house. Maybe I'm a little nerdy, but we gave up television for 20 years in our house. And uh, so <laughs> they're landing on the moon, and I'm not able to watch this on TV. We take the family, we go to a local motel, we saw the landing. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. One more question here. Firstly, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for taking the time today. Uh, my question is about problem solving. I'm fascinated by the engineering problem solving that you're talking about. I was wondering if there is a process that you have in place or maybe you have any pointers for how you go about solving these problems or does it simply come with experience? And if that's changed over the past 50 years for how people look at these problems, Problem solving, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preempt you, I'm sorry, <laughs> but hang on to that. If you take a test, you're problem solving, okay? I'm not the brightest light bulb in, a, in my engineering class, but I am stubborn. Uh, and uh, an aside, um, I didn't get accepted to graduate school. They said I was too stupid. Uh, okay, but I'm stubborn, I, and I actually tore the letter up, threw it in the trash. And this was early. And uh, then I thought about it and my wife and all that. I went and dug it out of the trash. I didn't accept that. And I went and talked to the head of the department. And I said, I want to get my master's degree in, in mechanical engineering. And he said, well, why don't you take a class or two and then we'll see. And I aced a couple of classes. So then they, they accepted me. So it's a, it's a bit of stubbornness on problem solving. That was just one problem solving. But I think uh, college really teaches you to do that. Uh, it's maybe a little bit formalized, but you, you do get the skills. And uh, of course, experience helps, but uh, Purdue does a good job at that. I, I'm really impressed with Purdue. Okay. Chet? It may be worth sharing a, a little book, uh, which, which I found fascinating uh, quite a number of years ago. There was a design professor at Stanford University named Jim Adams. He wrote this little book about this thick called Conceptual Blockbusting. Uh, it was a series of essays uh, about things that have gone wrong in various uh, uh, areas of scientific endeavor and, and, and why and how and what can you do to fix it. One of the stories he tells is about the Mariner Mars mission. <clears throat> and it was a deep space mission, of course, run by JPL. Uh, and there was lore throughout the spacecraft construction industry about how one builds these kind of spacecraft. Because as you know, it's sitting on top of a launch vehicle and it's got to be all folded in like that, right? And then when it, when it launches and goes, begins the deployment sequence, then all these things that stick out have to be very carefully unfolded. So it was well known in the industry lore that when you unfolded solar panels, these were very delicate and they were spring-loaded uh, uh, mechanisms that deployed them, you had to have a damper on them to keep them from hitting something you know, too hard and then shaking and damaging this, the uh, solar panels. Uh, well, a year before Mariner Mars launches, the story goes, uh, the mission critical item was the design of those dampers. The dampers were leaking a little bit of oil, just a very little bit, but they started thinking, long ways to Mars. 
and that oil is going to fly along with the spacecraft and it's going to form a cloud around it and some of it's going to condense onto those solar panels. It's going to cut the efficiency of the panels. It's going to drop the electrical output that's available to it. It would become a failure of mission just for that. They spent the better part of that year redesigning these dampers to no avail. Uh, it got to the point where uh, the, the launch window itself was, was at highly at risk. It wasn't until that moment, the story goes, that the failure modes effect analyst said, well, let's run a simulation of what happens if we don't have dampers at all. So we know what the limiting case is. So they ran that simulation. It was just fine. So the solution was shortly before launch, they told, pulled the dampers off, they threw them away, they went without them at all, and it worked just fine but it took an awfully long time to get to that point. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. I, I, I'm sorry to shut down the, the public session. We, we need to um, uh, wrap up here, and, and as I do that, I want to point out that there is a seven o'clock screening of the new documentary, documentary movie, uh, Armstrong, in this room. That's one of the reasons we need to finish up, and it is a public event. Everybody here is welcome to attend. There is no ticket required. So I want to very quickly here uh, have one, uh, have you three gentlemen answer a question, one sentence each. For the students uh, and the future students in the room here, if uh, they've certainly noticed that we're supposed to land on the moon in 2024. Let's say we have uh, a student here, he or she is in seventh grade. They do the math. And they say, 2024, it's going to be done by the time I graduate from Purdue. So, in one sentence, for the benefit of our future students and our current students, what do you see as the coolest, most exciting new thing coming along in aerospace that they should look forward to working on after they get their Purdue engineering degrees? I, I think, personally, the, the the ability to reuse rockets has been a really huge step, okay? Uh, the fact that we, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those coming back down and landing, it is, it is absolutely amazing. Okay, Ron? Um, I'm gonna go a little bit more than one sentence, but it's a three-part story. <laughs> I mean, so I think the first is, uh, is uh, embody the mission. Grab that mission yourself. It's more than what you know. You have to really kind of reach out to understand what the organization is trying to accomplish, whether it's in aeronautics or space or anywhere else. Second is step into the void. And by what I mean by stepping into the void is use your expertise against what you know about what the organization is trying to accomplish to identify areas that they're missing and figure out ways that you can fill those voids in. And the third part is say yes. And by that I mean when those surprises come along in your career, when somebody asks you to do something that you've never even anticipated as possible, say yes and take the chance and go for it. And you will be generally surprised that that was a good thing to do. Very good, Tim? Uh, well, I, I really think that uh, the Purdue Edge, I'm gonna toot Purdue's whistle here. I think the education here is outstanding. I think it gives you the base to do things. Uh, aeronautical engineering, yeah, it's, you know, it's airplanes, it's aerospace, what have you. But within it, there's so many things that can be done. So you, you don't have to build the rocket to whatever, but it's going to be out there in outer space. It's going to be out there in computer technology. It's going to be out there. There's just, it's, it's an industry it's about to re resurrect, and I think that's uh, an opportunity that's going to last the next 10 years. Easy. Very good. So we, we started off this uh, event with uh, the video of uh, President Kennedy in 1962, um, expanding on what he spoke of in 1961. And, you know, and Apollo 11 is magnificent, was magnificent, and we celebrate it now. Um, but so... You know, Kennedy's speech, yes, we did that. But perhaps the lesson uh, for our students and perhaps all of us tonight is not so much what we did, but what are we going to do? And uh, I, I just want to say, you know, surely after this weekend, we, we can't let Apollo 11 
fade into just a topic for history lessons and round-numbered anniversaries, right? So I, I want to urge our students and, and, and all of us, um, think about that. What are, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? What, what, how can we let this question, this Apollo 11 motivation, persist in our mind? Um, as it is an undeniable testimony to the, to the immense power of human collaboration, cooperation, and what that can achieve in under a decade. So I would urge you, let that drive your engineering and your human endeavors. Let that thought carry you on uh, for all of those endeavors uh, here on Earth and for some of you uh, I, I trust in the near future um, on your endeavors uh, off of the Earth. And so to everyone here, I thank you for your participation tonight. Um, this event is concluding, so good night, boiler up, hail Purdue, what are you going to do? And please join me in thanking our wonderful alums.